Welcome to the House Institute uh, Grand Rounds Lecture Series. Uh, today we're very excited to have a uh, very special person, uh, Dr. Uh, Bradley Kesser, who's going to uh, be speaking to us on uh, treatment of congenital oral atresia. Uh, Brad is at the University of Virginia and has done some fantastic work since he finished his fellowship uh, at House in 2000. And so for the last couple of years, he's been uh, busy uh, helping pursue and push the envelope of otology further. So Brad, why don't you take it away and thank you very much for joining us today. Well, Bill, thank you very much for, uh, for having me and inviting me. Uh, as we were saying, I can't believe it's been 20 years since I finished my fellowship at, uh, at House. And um, I was very, very lucky in my career to have had Dr. Jarsdorfer be one of my resident in residency, one of my mentors, and then coming out to house and having Dr. Dela Cruz be uh, a mentor for me as well. And then when I joined UVA, Dr. Jarsdorfer stayed on for a, a few extra years and taught me the finer points of atresia surgery. And from there, I've taken an interest in unilateral hearing loss in children, as well as trying to optimize outcomes for oral atresia surgery. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work out well. I've titled this talk, uh, Pearls and Pitfalls in the Management of the Congenital Ear. And uh, you'll see little tips and hints and uh, pointers that I've learned over the years that I want to share with you over the next 45 or, or 50 minutes. So here we go. You're called to see a newborn in the newborn nursery or maybe the newborn has come to see you in your, in your office and you've been asked to see this child for evaluation of an ear deformity. So I hope to convey what are the things that you think about on your way to seeing this child or as you're walking into the room, what are the ideas that, uh, that, that come to mind in evaluating the child with a quote, ear deformity? Ear deformities come in tons of different sizes and shapes. There's microtia, there are extra appendages. And then of course, evaluating the, the presence of an external auditory canal if it's stenotic, if it's completely atretic, and then of course, what is the, the status of the hearing, and is it in one ear or both? So I, I think, you know, first taking a look at the outer ear at the pinum and seeing the, the, uh, the configuration and the, the shape of the pinna is an important clue potentially to what's going on in the, in the ear canal in the middle ear. Dr. Jarisdorfer published a, a paper years ago that did show that the development of the pinna, the oracle, many times mirrors the development of the ear canal and the middle ear. So again, lots of different shapes and sizes to ears. This is a child with anosia. Uh, obviously, it's important to document associated skin pits, skin tags, and not necessarily those ear tags. Syndromic features, another important, and when I, uh, important uh, consideration. And when I give this lecture to an in-person audience, I always ask my residents, what syndromic features do you see in this child? This is a child with hemifacial microsomia or golden har. You can see the underdevelopment of the, mal of the mandible, and it's a, a microtia atresia on the right. This is a first arch underdevelopment um, feature. How about this child? This child has classic Treacher-Collins uh, features, mandibular, uh, uh, mandibular dysostosis, um, midbrain, uh, midface hypoplasia, bilateral oral atresia, and microtia. This one's not too difficult to pick out. This is a child with Down syndrome. We all know that Down syndrome's kids can be really difficult to examine in the office. They have very narrow ear canal canals, and they often have uh, eustachian tube dysfunction as well. And finally, how about this one? This is a child with an ear pit, uh, actually an ear tag, but then you see this little pit right here, just along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It would be important to document kidney function in this child with branchial renal syndrome. Then the status of the external auditory canal. Is it open? Is it stenotic? Is it a pinpoint? Is it closed or undeveloped? Is it bilateral or unilateral? Physical exam documenting the degree of microtia. Grade one is just a small ear, but does have all the uh, cartilaginous appendages associated with the ear, the helix, the anti-helix, the triangular fossa. Grade two is a small ear, but also, but does not have uh, those uh, cartilaginous, um, that cartilaginous framework. Grade three is the classic peanut ear, and 
anosia is a complete lack of ear. And so uh, it's also important to document facial nerve function. If the child has stenosis of the ear canal, thinking in the back of the mind, this could be a setup for a, an ear canal cholesteatoma should also, uh, again, be in the back of their mind. So oral atresia is a failure of the ear canal to open, an absent eardrum with variable development of the uh, middle ear ossicles. Prevalence is one in 10 to 20,000, 70% 70 are unilateral for reasons that we don't know. Boys are more commonly affected than girls. And also for reasons that we don't know, the right ear is more commonly affected than the left ear. It's almost always associated with a conductive hearing loss. So pearls and pitfalls, congenital oral atresia does not always occur in isolation. So think about ident and identify associated craniofacial abnormalities. And just because the oracle appears normal, do not assume the canal is patent and has developed. There is a condition, distal 18Q deletion syndrome, or de Grouchy, where a child is born with normal oracles, but complete absence of the external auditory canal. So that's very important, and that might be picked up on a newborn hearing screening test. There we go. So how are we going to assess the hearing? We'll back up for a sec. Well, this is the old way where uh, some doting women took a bullhorn to an unsuspecting little newborn and ran that bullhorn hard and looked for the startle response. Well, of course, we have more sophisticated ways of evaluating hearing now. We have newborn hearing screening, which usually takes uh, advantage of autoacoustic emissions, and we have auditory brainstem response testing. And this kind of leads me to my one slide on embryology. And this is the most important point about the embryology of the ear that, that I'll, I'll relate to you today. And that is, as you all know, the cochlea develops from the otocyst, from the neuroepithelium or neuroectoderm. However, the middle ear and the ear canal develop from the branchial apparatus. So the implication of this division in the embryologic primordia of the ear is that most children with oral atresia have normal cochlear function. But it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate that or to, to reassure ourselves of that. And how do we do that? Well, auditory brainstem response testing within the first three to six months of birth, uh, of course, doing autoacoustic emissions for the normal ear. As children get older, they're able to participate in a sound field audiogram with visual reinforced audiometry and OAEs in the toddler. And finally, we can do masked bone conduction thresholds for the atretic ear in the um, older, older child. But we can certainly do bone conduction ABR to in, assure ourselves that their child has normal cochlear function in the, either the unilateral or bilateral atresia child. So hearing evaluation within the first three months of life to document hearing status, and I think it is important to document air and bone conduction thresholds, even if the child has normal hearing in one ear. And I think this is an important pitfall do not assume the contralateral normal appearing ear hears normally. You've got to do the evaluation and make sure that the normal appearing ear does hear normally. And so once you've documented the physical exam characteristics, the history, as well as the audiometric profile, what's the next step? Is it time to get a CT scan? Do we put a bone conducting on these children? What's the role of a bone conductor or amplification in the child with unilateral oral atresia and normal hearing, ear, normal hearing in the contralateral ear? And then what type of amplification are we going to offer? A bone conductor, a, an osseointegrated bone conducting device, and there are lots of different choices now uh, available to us. So in my opinion, there is no need to get a temporal bone CT scan in the newborn period. There is nothing we're gonna do about the ear and getting a CT scan exposes the infant to a dose of radiation. So it's perfectly fine to hold off on the CT scan. Don't get the CT scan just to take a look. I think it's, uh, it doesn't serve the child well. In the setting of oral stenosis, where there's a pinpoint canal or a narrow canal that you can't get in, you can't clean, I would recommend a CT scan at the age of four or five, maybe a little bit earlier than the child with oral atresia, to evaluate for ear canal cholesteatoma. Otherwise, and only if the parents are interested in canal surgery, would I get a CT scan and at, at the age of five or six. And that's because I don't do the surgery until the children are six or seven. And I'll, I'll talk about why in just a sec. 
Dr. Brackman once told me, any child with an unexplained conductive hearing loss should have a temporal bone CT scan. And why? We want to identify potential causes of conductive hearing loss, including an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, which would give you a mixed hearing loss, occult or hidden congenital cholesteatoma. So, you know, we can look into the mesotympanum on our exam, but we can't see up into the epitympanum. Could the child have a congenital cholesteatoma up in the epitympanum, a facial nerve neoplasm up in the epitympanum, and to evaluate for a middle ear minor ossicular abnormality, including single stapes cruce, the malleus bar, incus lateral chain fixation, or IS joint disarticulation. So any child with an unexplained, they don't have middle ear fluid, conductive hearing loss, should undergo a temporal bone CT scan, and that can be done at the age of four, five, or six. Here's a scan of a child where we got an unexplained conductive hearing loss. The child had oral stenosis, and we noticed this opacification here in what might be the ear canal. Here's the middle ear space. These are the ossicles of fused malleus incus. And so we were concerned about the possibility of, a, of trapped skin, of canal cholesteatoma. So we proceeded with an MRI scan looking at the diffusion-weighted imaging and sure enough, there's this bright signal here on the DWI MRI scan, which is consistent with ear canal cholesteatoma. And so I recommended surgery earlier than I would normally do in a atresia operation in this child with trapped skin and congenital canal cholesteatoma. Or maybe it's an acquired cholesteatoma simply because the ear canal is too narrow. So what are the options for amplification? And even more importantly, what is the role or need for amplification in the child with unilateral oral atresia? This is kind of where I've focused some of my research efforts. Should we be putting bone conductors on every child with unilateral oral atresia? So the options would include observation with monitoring and mostly monitoring the normal hearing ear to ensure that the normal hearing ear continues to hear normally, preferential seating in class when the child goes to school, I stress an individualized education program or a 504C plan that will set up resources in the school system to set the child up for success in the classroom. The FM system, conventional amplification if the child has a, a normal or well-developed oracle, and then bone conducting technology and the osteo-integrated bone conducting hearing devices. So lots of different options out there, including uh, the non-invasive Medel uh, device, which is uh, the Adhere. That's an adhesive that goes behind the ear, and the sound uh, processor is just snapped onto the adhesive. In the FM system, the speaker or the teacher's voice is sent wires, wirelessly in real time from the transmitter to the receiver in the child's better hearing ear. It's non-invasive and it improves the signal to noise ratio in the classroom. The downside is they tend to be cumbersome. There's limited applicability outside the classroom setting. They certainly don't give sound localization. They don't hear a lot better in background noise, although if there is background noise and the teacher's voice is going to that child, that child will be able to hear the teacher's voice better. Bone conducting devices, bone conducting hearing system on a soft band or a hard band. These are non-invasive, they are effective, yet they can be uncomfortable. There is some attenuation of sound due to the scalp soft tissue. Adults have told me it just doesn't seem like it's natural. It's not a natural sound to them, but they can be effective. And I would argue that they are a must in children with bilateral oral atresia. I would absolutely, as soon as possible, within the first three to six months, put a bone conducting hearing device on a child with bilateral oral atresia having reassured or having ascertained that the cochlear function is normal. There are no, a number of different osseointegrated bone conducting devices on the market now. They're the percutaneous devices, including the Baja Connect by Cochlear. It's more efficient in its conduction of sound. The processor snaps onto the post that's surgically implanted. It's a secure fastening or a secure um, uh, application does require surgery. There is the cosmesis of the post. And if any of you have put these in, you have had wound issues and that can be a real drag. I will tell you though, clobetasol, um, it's a topical high potency steroid cream, has kind of changed the game. And that, that tends to work quite well in these patients um, with wound issues or skin issues around the post. And the FDA has not approved these devices for children younger than the age of five. 
Oticon Medical has come out, uh, has the, the, the Ponto device, which I've had uh, some good success with. Our audiologists like the Ponto device because it's on a hearing aid platform and it's very intuitive as far as the programming and the sound processing. The transcutaneous devices go across the skin through a magnetic system. There's the Baja Attract by Cochlear, which is put uh, essentially a magnetic plate that's put on the same uh, titanium implant that's put in uh, or drilled into the skin. There's no post, there are no wound issues. It does require surgery and potentially there's less efficiency in the conduction of sound. And in the high frequencies, the hearing does fall off. Actually, not only the hearing, but in an active child, the processor can fall off as well in the playground. The bone bridge by Medel is starting to gain some traction. Um, there's no post, no wound issues. This, uh, as opposed to the other devices that I discussed where the active transducer is worn on the outside, the bone bridge active transducer is actually in the bone itself. So this is a receiver that uh, receives sound. It sends it across the induction coil to the magnet on the inside that we put in, and then the actuator vibrates the bone directly on the inside, potentially leading to more efficient sound conduction. It does require surgery. It does require drilling the, um, the, the, the well for the canister, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. The co Cochlear Corporation has recently come out with its ASIA, or its active in, uh, middle ear implant. Again, it's still on the same titanium implant that's placed in the bone, but now we're connecting the actuator to that implant. And so the patient wears the magnet and the uh, stimulator on the outside. Again, the signal crosses the magnetic induction coil internally, which then vibrates the actuator affixed to the internal titanium implant. I put in one, uh, that one patient loves her cochlear osseo, and so I would certainly be willing to, uh, to, to continue uh, trying the, uh, the osseo. The Vibrant Sound Bridge is um, another um, active middle ear device. As opposed to putting the implant in the, skull, in the bone of the skull, this implant is placed, or the, the forced mass trans, or floating mass transducer is placed either on the stapes bone or on the incus bone. So you have to drill a canal. And I will also give the caveat, this is not approved by the FDA in this country for oral atresia, but it is well established in Europe, in Europe for oral atresia. It simply obviates the need for an ear canal. Now you do have to drill the canal, you have to access the middle ear, you have to liberate the ossicles. And once you've put the floating mass transducer on the mobile incus or mobile stapes, or even in the round window niche, the uh, processor is placed, or the receiver stimulator is placed under the skin, and much like the bone bridge and the cochlear ossea, the magnet is worn on the outside. So again, it obviates the need for the skin graft and the ear canal, and it can be an effective uh, device, but again, not approved by the FDA in the United States for oral atresia. So the pearls and pitfalls of these osseointegrated bone conducting devices include the percutaneous abutments, the connect and the ponto, deliver better sound fidelity at the cost of skin issues in some patients. The transcutaneous processors like the attract, the bone bridge, the cochlear ossea may not stay on an active child as well, and they're not as efficient in bone conduction. I'll also mention that the ASEA and the bone bridge are not approved for children younger than the age of 18. So we come to the controversy. Should we be doing these things on children with unilateral oral atresia and a normal hearing ear? And so if you weigh the pros and cons, the bone conductor does stimulate the atretic ear and the cochlea and the central auditory pathways they are already being stimulated by the child's speaking and the child's crying and the child's eating. So those pathways are being stimulated by internal sound. It certainly supports speech and language development and they do get head shadow. In other words, they're able to hear from that side so they don't have to turn their head to the good ear. On the downside, they do cost. They can be as high as $5,000. There's comfort and compliance issues, cosmesis issues, they don't get sound localization, maybe some marginal benefit in noise, and some studies have shown an overall perceived subjective or perceptual benefit to these bone conductors. So I mentioned hearing and noise and sound localization. 
these are binaural tasks. You can't do these when you have good hearing in one ear and poor hearing in the other. Do bone conducting hearing devices in a child with a normal hearing ear give patients improved hearing and noise and sound localization? Well, the studies are somewhat mixed, but I think, we, I think in my review of the studies, all the studies really show no difference in sound localization in the aided versus unaided conditions. In this study, children with unilateral conductive hearing loss, the hearing aid helped somewhat with hearing and noise, but did not improve sound localization. And here it shows there was some subjective improvement, but really no improvement in objective measures of sound localization and hearing and background noise. So we did a study about, uh, well, it's been seven years now, looking at children with unilateral oral atresia and how they did in school. We know historically from the Bess and Tharp studies in the mid 80s that children with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss are at risk for repeating or failing a grade and are at risk for academic dis difficulties in the school setting. So I wanted to ask the question, how about children with unilateral oral atresia? Are they at the same risk for failing a grade and for difficulty in school? And what we found in our group of 40 children, zero repeated a grade, yet two thirds of these children did use some resource. And I'll talk about the resources in just a second. Only about 12% exhibited any kind of behavioral problem. What was interesting is we didn't have very many fill out the survey in our unilateral sensory neural hearing, hearing loss group, but two of the 11 children did repeat a grade, and yet they also used quite a, uh, the same amount of resources. So if you compare the studies in our atresia group versus the Bess and Tharp group of 1985, it was statistically significant in their grade retention or failing a grade. There was also a statistically significant difference between our atresia group and our sensory neural hearing loss group. There was no difference in the sensory neural hearing loss group and the Bess and Tharp group. So despite 25 or 30 years of knowing these kids are at risk in, with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, we're really still figuring out what are the best resources to set these children up for success in the classroom. These are the resources that the children used and by far, most of them used, half of them used an individualized education program. So don't forget to talk about the IEP or the 504C so that the school system can set the child up for success in the, in the classroom. Interestingly, very few of our atresia group children used amplification, only 12%. And so if you look at the comparison, it was significant, more atresia kids used amplification. There was no difference in the use of resources between the atresia and the sensory neural hearing loss group. There was a significant difference between our sensory neural hearing loss group and the Bess and Tharp group. And then a, a sensory neural and atresia, there was a significant difference between Bess and Tharp. So an interesting, interesting comparison. So again, I, I put up the cost benefit analysis. I think we have to discuss this with families. Um, I, I will tell you my approach in just a second, but if you consider the prevalence rate of oral atresia, the cost would be $75 million to set every child with unilateral oral atresia up if you assume that the device costs about $5,000 and a prevalence rate of about 10 to, 10 to 15%. Again, a must in children with bilateral oral atresia. So here's my approach. Never discourage families from trying a bone conductor. Support and encourage their fam the family's desire to trial. I also tell parents, we have enough battles to fight as parents. Having your child with unilateral atresia wear a bone conductor for six or eight hours a day is not necessarily a battle we have to fight because there's no data to suggest that wearing a bone conductor offers any significant advantage in children with unilateral atresia. It's important to monitor the child's hearing and academic progress, support the child's speech and language development and academic progress, talk to the child, read to the child, IEPs I am wholeheartedly in support of, and potentially an earlier trial of the bone conductor leads to better adoption by the child. And so we've, we finally come to what about atresia repair surgery? Um, it's a difficult operation. It's important to know that not all children with oral atresia are candidates for canalplasty, and it is through both the audiometric evaluation and the radiologic evaluation that we can determine a child's candidacy for canal surgery. 
And those candidacy criteria include age, audiometry, the anatomy of the ear, and very importantly, their cooperability in the office. And that informs the age. So what's the ideal age to operate? There are some surgeons who'll do it as young as three or four. I really strongly feel that is not in the best interest of the child. I like around six or seven. Even Dr. Jarsdorfer would operate five, five and a half. And I've, I found that some five-year-olds are really great in the office. Some are not so great, but when they get to six or seven, they really, they do well. So why wait? Number one, radiation dose to, for the CT scan. Number two is change in the anatomy as the child grows. We all know that younger children have more problems with otitis media with effusion and eustachian tube dysfunction. I don't wanna open an ear and go through this big operation only to have a three or four year old have otitis media with effusion and not gain the benefits of the surgery. So I think eustachian tube maturity is important. You can't get good air and bone conduction thresholds or accurate audiometry in a three or four year old child, maybe four, but at five or six, they can cooperate in the audiometric booth. I think they do better with healing, the cooperation in the office, I can't stress enough. We've got to take the packing out. We've got to clean the ear. A three or four year old, you might have to take back to the operating room just to clean the ear. A five or six year old or six or seven year old really just gets it. They hop up in the chair. The cleaning is not painful. The packing removal is not painful. They're not scared and they, um, they, they cooperate so much better. Audiometrically, this is a child with bilateral oral atresia through the SAL procedure or sensory neural acuity level we can get individual bone conduction thresholds for each individual ear. And then here are the air conduction thresholds. Pre-op hearing predicts post-op hearing. How can we assure good hearing results after surgery? If the SRT is less than or equal to 50, they have a two thirds chance of normal hearing after surgery. But if the SRT is greater than 60, there's a, a, a less uh, chance that we can achieve normal hearing with surgery. Of course, I use the Jarsdorf for grading score. The stapes is important. It's assigned two points, but I will tell you another very important consideration, and that is the middle ear space. I think the more volume in the middle ear, the better the patient does, and the better the patient does long-term with stability of their hearing. So we did a study looking at the middle ear space, the middle ear volume. And so um, let me move my uh, bar here. There we go. So this is a normal ear, and we calculated using a system in our packs uh, a volume of almost 600 cubic millimeters. Atretic ears are, are smaller. This middle ear volume is only 251 cubic millimeters. Actually, that was atretic ear two. Here's a little bit larger middle ear volume. And so we wanted to know, is there a volume cutoff where children do better with their hearing after surgery? And sure enough, we did. And we found that cutoff to be about 300 cubic millimeters, where if you look, there was no difference on the y-axis is the pure tone average. And on the x-axis is uh, the pre-op versus post-op pure tone average. Before surgery, there was no difference in their preoperative pure tone averages. But after surgery, children with greater volumes, greater than 300, had better pure tone averages or lower pure tone averages. And that was also borne out by the speech reception threshold. Whereas after surgery, children with greater volume, greater middle ear volume, had lower speech reception thresholds. I'll just show you a few not candidates. Obviously, this child is not a candidate. You'd be drilling right into the middle cranial fossa if you tried to get a canal in there. Same reason here, there's low tegmen with no middle ear space, no aer aeration of the middle ear and no ossicles. This is a, an interesting one. If you were to, this looks like it's well aerated, looks pretty good, but if you follow the tegment in and you drop down, look at that. That facial nerve is, I mean, right there where you'd be trying to access the stapes bone. So due to the position of the facial nerve, that child is not a candidate for uh, canal surgery. So some general considerations about surgery. I do the canal surgery after the rib graft microtia repair, but before, the MedPOR microtia repair. So this is a child whose family has elected to have a MedPOR repair. So the posterior incision is right there. I incorporate the meatus into the posterior incision. It actually looks pretty nice. 
facial nerve monitoring, of course, and um, the arm or the, I've been doing uh, more legs recently because I get more reliable skin grafts and the skin graft has to be uh, super thin to, um, to be able to put in well. The approach, drilling the new canal, just an overview of the actual service surgery. I'll show you a couple of videos of the operation. This is a child with a grade two microtia. There's complete atresia of the external canal. We make a standard postauricular incision. We harvest temporalis fascia, nice piece of fascia to put in as an overlay temporalis fascia graft. And so here, I'm elevating the, I've elevated a periosteal flap, which is reflected posteriorly. So I've made periosteal incisions along the linea temporalis and anteriorly along the glenoid fossa and reflected the periosteum posteriorly. Now I'm elevating this periosteum here to identify the glenoid fossa. You've really got to identify that glenoid fossa and get your bony landmarks absolutely in good shape before you start the drilling. So those bony landmarks include the root of the zygoma up here. This is a right ear in the surgical position the glenoid fossa right here, and the mastoid tip. The glenoid fossa almost looks like an ear canal, and the drilling is similar to a mastoidectomy in that you're going to stay anterior superior into the root of the zygoma, staying along the linea temporalis and the glenoid fossa. The key to drilling the canal is to identify the tegmen and follow the tegmen medially. If you can identify that tegmen, the tegmen will take you right into the epitympanic space. And once you've accessed the epitympanum, you drop down just a bit to identify the atretic plate and the ossicular chain. So here we've got our landmarks. This is the glenoid fossa. We're starting up here in the anterior superior quadrant with a five millimeter cutting burr. And the first thing I try to do is really come up top and identify the tegmen up here. And once I've got the tegmen, I start going more medially. The tegmen will keep me out of trouble, keep me away from the ossicular chain, and keep me away from the facial nerve. All right, so now I've drilled all the way down. Here you can see there are no air cells. This is nicely polished tegmen right here. This is again the, the same ear, the right ear. And so I'm staying, this is this dark or this um, solid bone is the atretic plate. And so I'm right in these little pneumatized air spaces between the tegmen and the atretic plate looking to access the epitympanum. So unlike a normal ear canal, which is centered at the mesotympanum, the atretic ear canal is centered at the epitympanum. And so now I've eggshelled that bone and I'm using a dental excavator to pick away some of this um, a fragmented bone. And here I'm in the epitympanum and I'm looking at an ossicle right there, which I'll palpate. And it is somewhat mobile. So now I'm in the epitympanum, I've palpated the ossicles. The key now is to drill away all the atretic plate without transmitting that high energy of the drill to the ossicular chain. And so here I've exposed the entire atretic plate, or the atretic bone, I'm sorry, I've exposed the ossicular chain by drilling away all the atretic bone. The facial nerve can come up pretty fast on, on you in this posterior inferior quadrant. So you have to be careful. I exposed a little bit of the facial nerve right there. Thankfully, I, obviously you use facial nerve monitoring, but um, I'm always a little bit more cautious and a little bit more careful in this posterior inferior quadrant because the facial nerve, you can see it down here in the tympanic segment. And I mean, it takes a sharp turn right here and comes very laterally as I was drilling the plate over here. So when we enter the middle ear, we can see the fused malleosynchus complex. And once we've drilled away all the atretic bone, I take a little 59 beaver blade, sharp as possible to incise the ligamentous attachments between the malleus neck, so this is the malleus, this is the malleus neck, between the malleus neck and the atretic bone. So there are always these little ligamentous attachments that you have to come through. Now you can do this with a laser, but I, I like the feel, I like the touch of, of using that 59 beaver blade and just very, very gently sawing through those ligamentous attachments. And now I'm taking away this final piece of atretic bone so that we've now freed the ossicles really well and they can 
they can vibrate freely in space, and there's very little risk of new bone growth across this big divide. The skin graft is tough. So, sorry. Uh, you've got to harvest it very carefully. It's a five inch blade, two inch cutting width at 0 0.006 inches thick. Very, very thin. I take it about five to six centimeters in length. And I prepare the graft by notching it. I cut it in a bit of a trapezoid so that this is the meatal side. This is the, that has to be longer to go circumferentially around the meatus. And then the medially, these tabs align so that it covers the temporalis fascia graft. So here's the temporalis fascia graft. It's an overlay graft with care taken to tuck one or two millimeters of fascia up onto the bony canal in all dimensions. You can see how the ossicular chain is seen in relief. I drape as much surface area of that ossicular chain as possible with the fascia graft. And so here's a, a video. It's a Nice large graft there. And I just very carefully, just like you were to put in a lateral surface graft, like, like we were taught, it comes up on the anterior canal wall and I just very gently tuck it in place. And you can see the ossicular chain coming into view through the fascia graft. And so it's really important to tuck that graft down around the ossicular chain and drape it up onto the canal wall. Placing the skin graft is tough. Uh, aligning the tabs medially over the fascia, it drapes onto the bony canal wall. So here the tabs, they cover the fascia graft. The edges meet anteriorly so that the skin doesn't go back into the mastoid through the additus. And this is a, a bit of a long video, I'll cut it short, but I want you to see the tabs here. And so we're, and Dr. Delacruz used to put a little blue mark on the tabs um, and it, he would align those tabs beautifully. I started putting blue marks on, but I don't know, for some reason, it just turned into a blue mess by the time uh, I was putting in the, the fascia graft. So I, I kind of abandoned the blue, the blue mark on the, on the notch. But that's the notch number one. Here comes notch number two. And you just kind of work your way around like, <clears throat> like a clock, putting those notches down over the fascia graft. And it takes time and it takes patience and I use a really nice ball probe to get those grafts down. You've got to unfurl all those edges. You can see how tab one aligns with tab two right there. Here comes tab three down. After the skin graft, I place a silastic disc. This disc, <clears throat> excuse me, recreates the anterior tympanomiatal angle. So this disc goes down over the skin graft and the fascia graft. And I carefully place it down. And once I've secured it in position, I will next place a uh, three quarter length Miracel wicks. And I'll usually be able to get about four or five wicks in the canal. And each one goes in and then I'll hydrate those wicks with a uh, floxin odic solution. And as they hydrate, they expand. And as they expand, they'll hold the skin graft against the bone from which it will, the, the skin graft will get its blood supply. So this is floxin odic, and they expand nicely and hold that skin graft in place. And then I'll drape the lateral portion of the skin graft over the hydrated wicks. The meatoplasty. I develop an anteriorly based conchal skin flap. So I make a curvilinear incision starting at the inferior tragus, extending posteriorly, then superiorly, then anteriorly to the superior aspect of the tragus. I elevate this conchal skin flap from the underlying soft tissue and cartilage and reflect it anteriorly. I then will, <clears throat> I then will resect the underlying soft tissue and cartilage and dunk this flap medially and sew it to a cuff of periosteum at the temporomandibular joint. So that this flap, this anteriorly based conchal skin flap will become the anterior lateral canal wall. And so you can see the, that conchal skin flap here is dunked in and is the anterior lateral canal wall. We're looking through the new canal 
out and we're looking at that skin graft. And so now I take those, those free ed, the free edge of the skin graft and deliver it up into the meatus. And I'll trim a little bit of the excess skin and unfurl these kind of rolled edges or these, uh, these, these folds and suture the edge of the skin graft to the patient's native skin with interrupted 5 fast absorbing gut suture. And then once the sutures go in, I put more Miracel wicks out here in the lateral canal. And so there the wicks go in and I'll hydrate those wicks with the Floxin Odic solution. And again, those wicks will expand and hold the skin graft in place. Before med pore, so this is the meatoplasty before the med pore reconstruction, you can see the ossicular chains straight down through the canal. Here's the temporalis fascia graft over the ossicular chain. Here's the skin graft that's been placed down in. Here's the wick. And now I'm simply going to sew the skin graft to the native skin of the, uh, of the posterior, native posterior skin. And there it is. And there are my uh, Pope earwicks. On post-op day one, we take the dressings down, change the cotton ball, put bacitracin over the meatus area, some suture line care, keep the ear or the arm, keep the ear and the arm or the leg dry. On po at one week post-op, I take the Miracel packing out, take the silastic out, take the sutures out, and then put them on antibiotic eardrops for a week and keep the ear dry. At one month, the skin graft sloughs this dead skin layer. So I have to clean that dead skin layer and it generally just peels right off. We'll check the arm, the skin graft donor site, and we'll do our first uh, post-operative audiogram. And the child will need cleaning every six to 12 months forever. And, and once the skin graft matures, it's generally about once a year that they'll need cleaning. And that cleaning is just lifting off that dead skin layer and peeling out the dead skin. All right, so how do we do on hearing? Uh, a few years ago, we looked at 116 ears. The Jarsdorfer grade was absolutely prognostic in its ability to predict postoperative hearing outcomes. So if you look at Jarsdorfer scores of six or below, there was only about a 45% chance that the child would get an SRT of less than 30. But if the Jarsdorfer score was seven, eight, or nine, there was an almost 85% chance of achieving normal or near normal hearing with surgery. So anatomy is absolutely critical. And I think that middle ear anatomy is, uh, is, is critical, which I'll show you in just a second. We recently published our long-term data. So these are children greater than one year out from surgery. We had uh, 138 ears. The mean preoperative air conduction pure tones average was about 60. The post-op at one month was about 29 with a nice gain of 30 dB, but they lost about eight decibels on average over the long, top, long term. So their final gain was about 22 dB with a, uh, a final pure tone average of 37, which you know, with, a, with a hearing aid, if they wanted to wear a hearing aid in their new ear canal, could certainly bring them back into the normal range. This is the spaghetti plot of our data. These are all the ears pre-op. You can see, uh, and then I'll show you, let's see, on the x-axis is days post-op. It's a logarithmic scale so that uh, the pure tone average drops nicely in the first month. And then there's some variability in some children did lose hearing over time. That hearing loss averaged, again, about, about eight, uh, eight, 8 dB. So middle ear volume, we divided our patients into best hearing outcomes as, de as defined by an SRT or a per, per turn average of less than, less than or equal to 30 and worse outcomes. And these are children one year or greater uh, out from surgery. And absolutely, children with higher middle ear volumes, this is, these are over 400 for the mean, this is only about 300 for the, um, the worst hearing group, but children with greater middle ear volume definitely maintained good hearing over the long term. There are definitely complications of surgery, indications for revision surgery, ear canal stenosis is probably the greatest. 
And that operation is usually the lateral canal stenosis. I cut all the scar tissue out, I put a new uh, skin graft in, and they generally do pretty well. And I'll, I'll talk in a sec, in fact, right now, about how I manage this. So I will inject triamcinolone 40 in that perimeatal skin here, and I'll have the parents put a foam earplug at night coated in a water-soluble lubricant to keep the ear canal open. And parents will even tell me in the morning when they take the plug out, the canal is beautiful, it's open, and by the evening, they've already noticed some narrowing or stenosis of the canal. And they may have to do that for three or six months after the surgery, but eventually that, that, that fibrotic reaction or that inflammatory reaction that's laying down scar tissue will, uh, will cease. Okay, we'll finish up with canalplasty versus uh, osseointegrated bone conducting device. Um, let me just want to check the time. Hold on just one sec. Make sure we have time. Okay, we're almost done. Um, so what about canalplasty versus the osseointegrated bone conducting device? Canal is difficult, higher rate of complications, absolutely variable hearing outcomes like we looked at. Do they get sound localization? Some preliminary studies that we've done show they are better after surgery, but still not as good as um, two normal hearing ears. Do they get better hearing in noise? And some families want the opening. They want the cosmetic hole in the, in the ear canal. The bone conductors are easier. There are minor complications. There's excellent hearing. There's predictable hearing. Cosmesis can be an issue depending on the device. Um, they typically don't get sound localization, not a whole lot of gain on not hearing and noise. So this, station, patient, uh, this study looked at 20 patients undergoing canalplasty versus 20 patients having a Baja. The hearing gain, 47 dB and 40 dB at, at six and 12 months. The aided ear canal surgery results were comparable to Baja results. So that is if they put a conventional hearing aid in their new ear canal, they could get the uh, gain up to the normal range. This is a very good review uh, by Nataraj and Kay Chang at in San Francisco, looking at um, 516 patients undergoing canalplasty and 100 patients. This is a literature review. 74% um, achieved an SRT of less than 30, 60% pure tone average less than 30, 69% air bone gap less than 30. But look at the numbers for bone conductor. I mean, I tell parents, I can't beat bone conducting hearing with canal surgery. But the question is, do they get sound localization? Do they get hearing in, in background noise? Um, that is, again, some areas for, uh, for research. So finally, options for hearing habilitation. We talked about preferential seating in class, the IEP, the FM system, conventional hearing aids in a well-developed oracle, bone conducting technology, and canal surgery. And finally, I want to um, stress one other um, issue in children with hearing loss, and that is fatigue. Um, we looked at a multi-dimensional fatigue survey administered to children and their parents with bilateral hearing loss, unilateral conductive hearing loss, unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, and normal hearing ears. And what we found, interestingly, was there was no difference in child-reported surveys of their fatigue levels when comparing the normal hearing children to children with oral atresia, unilateral oral atresia. We found a large difference in fatigue levels in comparing the normal hearing children with children with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And we also found a statistically significant difference in children with unilateral conductive hearing loss versus unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So what do we have to offer these families? We can also talk to them about fatigue and about tiredness and children need rest or downtime after they come home from school. We did the parent report, of course, and, uh, and parents of children with unilateral oral atresia did report higher levels of fatigue than normal hearing, than parents of normal hearing children. So that was across the different uh, domains of fatigue. So another important point, another important thing we can counsel parents on with regard to helping their children. With regard to fatigue levels, children with bilateral hearing loss, I didn't show that data, have more fatigue than children with unilateral hearing loss. 
children with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss have greater fatigue levels than children with unilateral conductive hearing loss and conductive hearing loss about the same as controls in the child reported fatigue levels. So every child is different. It's up to us and it's incumbent upon us to try to optimize resources for these families. Preferential seating, FM systems, speech therapy, IEPs, 504Cs, and then choosing the right amplification device or surgery for their child. We're still trying to understand the role of surgery. I think we do need longitudinal follow-up. I'm starting to try to follow long-term how these children are doing. It's important to monitor the hearing and academic progress. It's important for us as neurotologists to know all the options for hearing habilitation in children with both unilateral and bilateral oral atresia. As I've mentioned several times over the course of the talk, bone conducting technology is a must in children with bilateral oral atresia, yet the benefits are really unclear at this time in unilateral oral atresia. But it's important to support a family's decision and not be so dogmatic as to say, you must put your bone, a bone conductor on your child with uh, unilateral oral atresia. Surgery for oral atresia is technically difficult. Patient selection, as I mentioned, and as I stressed, is, uh, is critical. Meticulous technique at each stage of the operation can lead to some really excellent results and to some really grateful children and really grateful parents. Uh, and then, uh, as you saw, rest at the bottom. We as surgeons can also make sure that we counsel our parents on, um, on rest. Early detection of hearing loss is important. A trial of early intervention is, uh, it would be supported, what I, I would agree with. Intervention may help the child meet his or her full potential and monitor the hearing and academic progress. Simply setting the children up for success, I think is part of our role as uh, a kind of a holistic neurotology, uh, neurotologist surgeon. Thank you.